well merchandise fame creative bankruptcy long ago the four nations lived together in harmony then everything changed when hollywood ran out of ips only the original series that was created with an artistic eye could achieve it all but when the world needed it most it ended on a high note a few years passed and they discovered a new corpse to milk into a live action adaptation Although the show is better than their last attempt, it has a lot to learn before it's ready to entertain anyone. But I believe Avatar should have been kept frozen. Since we didn't learn our lesson the last time and people were actively hyping and anticipating the show, we showed Hollywood that it was a good idea to create another live action Avatar. While this show is nowhere near as amazing as the cartoon, it's also not as trashy as the movie. Throughout the show, I keep asking myself, why did a live action show have to be made? Then it all hit me. The bad dialogue, the character assassination of our heroes, and the over usage of Ozai. This show is clearly made by Fire Nation descendant sympathizers. They are actively making bad live action adaptations as propaganda to hate the Avatar. With this context, you will be able to unsee the decisions made in this show. Just like Zuko, no matter how many mistakes they make, they refuse to go down. But because they are Fire Nation, they can't do anything right. Meaning, the more they try to hate on the original, the more powerful it becomes. So how exactly does this live action show do everything in its power to advertise the cartoon? The genius of this show constantly expositing horrible dialogue blankly at the audience as if you were a child is that it makes you remember, wow, the cartoon made for kids was never written this badly. And once you realize that, it becomes abundantly clear what this show accidentally is. It's just one long commercial to make you want to watch the animated show. Because the longer you watch this, the more you'll want to turn it off and watch the original masterpiece. Who would purposely go out of their way to spell everything out to their audience? If it only stopped at the dialogue, there would not be enough evidence to convince you to rewatch the cartoon. So they took the fun, colorful adventure and took the fun and color out. And you're just left with an adventure where we're told these characters travel to the opposite side of the world. When the showrunner said they wanted that Game of Thrones audience, I don't think people read that comment as the characters would be teleporting across the map. At the very least, they brought back the incest from Game of Thrones. Forget the next couple lines, but uh, then it goes. Secret tunnel, secret tunnel, through the mountain. Secret, 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 secret tunnel. Yeah. What a cool looking world with a well thought out power system. Gee, would sure be a shame if neither of those were properly explored. And you would have to get your fill in by having to watch a show with an actual beginning middle and end and if you took a second to admire the best part of this show which is the cgi animation you'll begin to ask yourself huh if so much of the show is animated why not just fully animate the show if you're not going to make your show as faithful to the original show you're using for clout then why bother it's funny that this show has the exact same issues as the netflix one piece live action adaptation and almost the same things worthy of praise both are badly paced speedruns that hit the plot points from their source material but do not develop how the cast should get there. Most of the characters are underdeveloped and some don't get any development at all. The best things they did have going for them is their set designs and special effects. It's all so superficial. What Netflix did not account for is that One Piece fans are way less critical of Oda and essentially call him Goda whenever his pen and paper make contact. If Oda decided to write the worst chapter known to man by character assassinating the main character, rewriting his entire power system, and making him a destiny child chosen one with godlike powers instead of a hard worker who earned his spot at the top, One Piece fans would find a way to praise Oda and tell you he's been foreshadowing this 
since Chapter 1. Avatar fans have experienced both heaven and hell thanks to this franchise. They've seen how far the series can rise and how low it can drag them down. I think a live action adaptation of this show was a bad idea from the beginning. Given the choice to make a new story within the 10,000 year existence of the Avatar or retell Aang's story again, they chose to tell Aang's story for a third time because it'll rake in more cash, but it will also bring in much harsher criticism because we know how this story is supposed to be told. Let's be real here. In another 16 years, will we see another adaptation of the animated show or an adaptation of this live action adaptation? So let's talk about Aang's story. Apparently, he has no time to goof off or go through a character arc. It feels like we're watching some bizarre version of this character with the same name and design, but it isn't completely the same person. Even though characters keep on chastising him for being a kid that gets easily distracted. Wait, how would they even know if he was goofing off? Did they watch the cartoon and mix these guys up? He's so focused on going straight to the finish line and not having any fun, Aang doesn't even have time to learn anything, not even waterbending. My guess is, this is the writers foreshadowing how Aang skips out on his own development, just like how he'll skip out on his kid's growth one day too. It was a brave choice making Sokka less sexist and not grow and not learn from his bad actions. To compensate for this, the universe lashes out on every female character. Now, all the female characters are defined by their male character counterparts. Suki is hot for Sokka right away and thanks him for rocking her old boring world for merely existing. Yue is there to remind us all how hot Sokka is. Azula is shown to be just an abused little girl desperate for her daddy's approval. Katara is dependent on Aang's and Sokka's approval to do anything. It's like the sexism intertwined in the fabric of the universe had to balance itself out. By removing one sexist, 10 fem cells come to replace his spot. Nice try, universe. Can't get rid of us that easily. Speaking of Katara, her character in this show is that she showed up. The aspects of her character where she's meant to be hopeful and intensely passionate about her core beliefs didn't make the final cut. She's watered down to the point that her sole purpose feels like she's there to show the audience what waterbending is. Speaking of serving no purpose, let's look at why they made Azula this seemingly nice girl, but deep down she's secretly this no-nonsense business mogul who will destroy anyone who stands in her way. It's the showrunner's way of throwing shade at Pokimane for stealing their content, so they stole her entire personality and placed it into Azula, which in concept is fine, because both Pokimane and fire are a sight to behold, but if you get too close, prepare yourself to get burned. The Azula and Ozai scenes aren't bad because they're written badly, they're bad because they're written badly and are unnecessary. Here's a timeline of each of those scenes, and I have an easy and cost effective way of making those scenes better. With this one change, we eliminate scenes that add nothing and give us more time to spend with the gang. And here's my easy and huge cost effective way of making Avatar fans lives better in general. Even Ozai. I liked him better when his character was taking inspiration from Mr. Game & Watch, where he was covered in shadows and mainly spoke in grunting sound effects. Mike Goat doesn't have enough material to stand around and do nothing for two seasons. I hate to be that um, actually kind of guy, but the animated show introduces him perfectly. We have no reason to like this man and all the evils that have been committed because of him. And as Zuku is finally allowed home, the camera slowly builds up his reveal. And instead of some monstrous being, we found out it's this normal looking guy. Even though all these horrible things have been enacted through him, his kid sees him in the sympathetic light. I will give the show this. Zuko is played pretty well. I would have traded some of his whining for anger as that's what he believes his source of his strength comes from, but then we get his backstory. Sure, making his crew the 501st was a good idea as some sort of punishment by his dad, but the lead up to get there was a mess. In this show, instead of Zuko's honor forcing him to speak out against his dad, his opinion is forced out by his dad, and instead of Zuko refusing to fight his dad at all, he essentially beats him and refuses the last punch. This is the guy that Aang has to master all four elements to beat. She, at this point, Aang doesn't even need to master anything. He's probably good enough 
to take him out right now. Ozai has to go through some real mental gymnastics to find an excuse to abuse him in front of a whole crowd because he wants to. Here, they have to find some weird justification like they actually believe that Ozai believes in Zuko becoming stronger. He is supposed to be a genocidal maniac. We don't need every character to be sympathetic. There's a great episode I want to reference for comparison to this adaptation called The Ember Island Players, where the gang go watch a retelling of their adventure. And instead of a well-told narrative, they come to find out each one of their characters have been slanderized to all hell, focusing on one specific aspect of each character to represent who they are as a whole. Aang is just an airhead. Katara becomes this generic, busty, strong female protagonist who is overly sentimental. Sokka is a bumbling idiot, and Zuko is boiled down to only being a whiny crybaby. While this live action adaptation aired and went by, the co-creators had nothing to say on it since they left the project due to creative differences, which is code for, I can't say what I actually want because I still want to work in the industry. Not even a single insincere tweet about all the hard work that was put into the final product. But here's what they had to say on the idea of creating this episode of the cartoon. That wasn't a good play. I'll say. No kidding. Horrible. You said it. But the effects were decent. And then I'm not sure, but I feel like the writers might have thrown this reference in for the uh, M. Night movie that's coming up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the effects were decent. <laughs> and damn, 16 years later, they were spot on. Twice. Just like the plot, the power system, and the world, if you want well-defined, explored characters, this show is basically begging you to watch the cartoon. Here's the part of the video where I would criticize what happened throughout the show. But honestly, if the show doesn't feel like writing a tight narrative, I don't feel the need to describe how it's boring from scene to scene. So little happens, and most of what does happen is so uninteresting that you could cut episodes 2 to 6 out and nothing really changes. Our characters don't grow or develop in that time anyway, and they can basically teleport from episode 1. So why bother going through all of it? It feels more like a tour through the Avatar world rather than an adventure. Even this show's title card looks like shit smeared across the screen. Definitely not subtle about how they feel about the source material. While I don't usually believe genocide is the correct way to deal with those that don't give you everything you want, this live action show didn't convince me well enough that it isn't a good way to deal with your issues. You don't necessarily need strong themes to make a good narrative. Themes should be there to enhance the story being told, not the sole drive of characters or the plot. But if you're given all these well-explored themes on a silver platter, you'd want to use at least one of them, right? You never want to be in a situation where you're put in comparison against the cartoon. It will not go well for you. Just look at how that turned out for The Legend of Korra. And that shows only a sequel to the original. You were too good for this world. For the people who actually were excited for this show, I gotta ask, why? For reference, here's a list of all the good live action adaptations. So why did you think this would be any different? Besides remilking this cash cow for a third time, and again, I gotta ask, was it worth it? It'll just be another attempt to reach the heights of the original, but be unable to catch that lightning in a bottle. I hear they're making more Avatar animated projects. Hopefully, the negative reception doesn't affect the artists and the animators working on them, because honestly, I just don't see the point of this show. There's just no need to dredge up its grade every five years or so. I thought showing, not telling, would have helped this show out immensely, but honestly, sometimes not showing and quitting while you're ahead is the better play. More or less, less is more, and the less of this the better. This is the worst kind of show to review. Not painful enough to tear apart, and nowhere near great enough to endlessly praise. Just sitting in the middle of mediocrity. As a TV show, this show sucks, but as a commercial for how great the original was, you couldn't have asked for anything better.